Okay. So, I will take the last presentation. So you can come my time. So thank you very much. I'm Shekbo from University of Dakar, Senegal. And I'm very happy to come for a presentation which is trying to give a life to some of the concepts we have seen uh, from Roberto, from Jim, and uh, from our friend uh, coming from India. Uh, I do not like fancy titles, but I was thinking that this title could convince you uh, according to the contents of the presentation. Water from the skies and response from above. This is exactly the situation in, in Africa. When climate variability is too strong, the response always comes from the government. And the bottom-up aspect, the bottom-up dimension you're talking about is extremely missing there, and that make a big limitation in implementing adaptation strategies in, in this context. So I'm going to, to take the example of Dakar City and raise the issue of vulnerability to climate variability and how these responses are mishandled at local level and what are the consequences of those um, responses. The, the first point is to show you how rapid the evolution of the city has been in, in Dakar. And I try to roughly compare, compare the colonial time versus the post-colonial time. We have two kind of urban system in Africa. Once the system was ruled by uh, the colonial metro, metropole, like in France, they had strict rules and there was a big domination of these uh, metropole countries. So a lot of uh, consideration in terms of ruling and accepting to, 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 to follow the zonation of the area has been um, followed up. But after the independence time, a lot of rules was broken because the government was overwhelmed by rapid demographic growth, big crisis. There was a lot of big issues which are not climate related, but which, which will influence the process of vulnerability to climate change. And we will take the example of uh, urban, urban flats in, and vulnerability in Dakar uh, and how this, the population are exposed. Um, we will suggest uh, along this presentation the analysis of responses, uh, structural versus community responses, the financial stakes, because we are talking about money. When, when it comes to adaptation. We are talking about taking the means, buying the goods, and bringing it to local people. And there are a lot of stakes associated to that in a context of poverty. And therefore, there are some social dimension also you will see along. So a very rough statement here is the magnitude of flooding, how much floods has affected local population in Dakar. It's about 25% of the population outskirts. 11% of the overall population. You think about our cities as having more than 25, 30% of the overall population of the country. Dakar has 20.5 million out of 12 million on the overall country. So it's a big city compared to the country size. If 11% or 25% of this population is affected by floods, it's kind of big social issue. And the, the floods, as I mentioned it here, has affected these villages or these, these uh, uh, areas which are mostly on poor area, on poor zones. The U.S. Army has taken a picture of Dakar in 1942 to prepare for opposition against the Nazi, you know, the world, Second World War. And that was a lucky picture for us because it shows the situation uh, of Dakar uh, in, in that period. The main settlements, it's difficult to interpret here, but I'm trying to get the, yeah. The main settlements was the plateau, where you have the harbor, that was the, end, the point of uh, good exchange or good exportation from Africa to France. We have the airport, oops, yes, right here, small airport, and a couple of small villages, which are native population villages. All the rest of the landscape was water stream, natural vegetation, fields, etc., etc. Look at the situation in 2007, a courtesy of USGS again. All those natural areas was completely occupied. No discrimination about depressions, no discrimination about clay areas. Every piece of land is occupied. And you know the reason? That is, Dakar area is surrounded by water. It's not like these big cities where you have a lot of space and people can expand. 
we do not have the choice. We are squeezed in space and people had to build every piece of land. And therefore, they occupied unsuited land. Between 1942 and 2007, the city has been completely occupied. Now we get interested in knowing what is the topographic situation of, of, the, of the metropole. As you can see here, more than 30% of the overall area, which is only 500 square meters, only on 500 square meters, you have more than 30% below 5 meters high. We take the SRTM uh, digital terrain model to, to do this map. So, and the point I want to raise here is that the poor people has come to occupy all these low lands which is in the middle, it's called the picking area. If you make some research in Google Earth, you'll, you'll find it. So if you try to look at the situation in one of these poor areas, which is Yumbel here, you go down to a population or demographic uh, increase, which is very, very quick and has some impact on, on, on the land occupation. In 1954, with aerial photographs, the area would tend to be only on this strip because it was a highland. The population knew that it's very risky to go down, so they occupied the highlands. Fine. After the drought of the 78s, a lot of things occur in Africa. First, we have the drought. Second, the oil crisis. Um, and third, you know, the donator international community was getting low. So poverty and vulnerability was getting um, important, both in the cities and in the rural side. And as uh, our, guy, our, our colleague from, from India mentioned, it's important to consider the rural dimension of it. Because the increase of Dakar is not only a natural increase, but it's also a big rural exodus of rural population who was poor and come back in, into the city. So when they come, they acquire land in all the flat prone areas. And you can calculate the area uh, di dynamics in here where you have uh, this is houses in here. The houses are increased, but everything else, natural vegetation, swamps, etc., has been completely occupied. Impervious has been created. Runoff has been disturbed, and you will see it in, in the other slides. This is just a quick slide showing where the population of Dakar has been in 1954. This is the scale of population. It was less than 500,000 in 1954. By 2005, we was over 2.5 million CF, uh, persons in, the, in these 500 square meters. And then extreme events has increased uh, the vulnerability. The August month rainfall has been changing over the years. You have the gray bar here, which is August month's uh, rainfall. It has been very high over the past, but out of the sudden, it starts decreasing in the last decade, the August rainfall has gone very, very high. In one month, you can have 50% of the overall rainfall of the, of the season. And this intensity of rainfall create this big extreme force we have in Dakar over time. This is some evidence of the land occupation. You, see, you can see how dense is it. But the most important is to see how this is related to the topographical situation. This is, again, this digital terrain model and all the bluish and like uh, yellow things are the low lines. You can see it in a, in a three-dimensional view here. And some of these lakes can be seen as a picture in this, in this image. But what happened is local population tend to go down to these streams because it was dry at some time. And once they, at that time, they were getting their house built, this area was kind of dry. With the comeback of the rain season, all these areas are flat. This is a map of flood vulnerability. And you can see the houses, all these houses, which are inside um, these depressions. In 2009, the floods has affected about 20,000 um, uh, families uh, in, in Dakar City and create a big social crisis. Oops. Oh, man. OK, no problem. This is a, this, uh, the view of the digital terrain model in three dimension. We, we try to wrap the, the houses on top of the, of the terrain model. The important message I want here to, to raise 
is the fact of blocking the water streams. People will settle in depressions. They're not only exposed to, 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 to flooding, but they block the water flow, uh, flow down to the, to the lakes. So all the water system, all the water streams are completely disturbed. So we are creating small lakes here and there, and the flood magnitude has been bigger and bigger. And this is the results. Um, this was a 2008 picture. These guys. And you see the houses which are blocking the water stream, it creates this type of situation. They block the water and the water enters the houses. So once, one way to deal with the flooding in this context is to try to reconstruct, to reshape the, the water basins and enable the water to naturally flow. And people are trying to pump the water, but look at in terms of extreme situation. Oops. My animation do not work. What I want to raise here is the water is coming from the water table. So we have a big saturation of the water table. A small amount of rainfall can create a rapid occupation of water in these depressions. And what the government is doing now is to, to buy big pumps and try to get the, to pump the water out of the areas. So it's trying to, they are trying, as I said in the beginning, to respond, to bring bad response uh, good response to bad, to bad questions. The question is not to pump the water, but the question is how to improve urban, urban structure. All the pictures of impact, you have seen it, all these houses, you know, health issues in, in this area. Even, even some areas which are supposed to be rich are affected because people do not take into account the infiltration um, uh, process in the area. So now comes the social issues. In 2005, after the big um, flood, we, we know the government and the army, they said some things with a lot of issues. Women was raped, education was break down. There was so many big issues there because it was really difficult to control it. And then they, they saw that most of the schools in the urban outskirts, these schools was in depressions. So now, once we have flood, we take people to the schools as shelters, but the schools are flooded. And right after the rain season, the school has to open. The kids need to go to school, but the school has water. So it creates a big mess and problems in, in the country over time. And this has been the situation uh, this year. We have 94 schools which was flooded, completely flooded, when people were needing it to, to start school. So a lot of social issues are, are there. All the dimensions um, of it is population movement. We, we, we do think that when these floods affect these areas, people will move from their houses, but right after the rain season, they will come back. So, and once they come back, there is a big exposure to, to big um, health issues like meningitis, cholera, etc. So the public health issues is extremely present in this, in this business. Now, what, to solve these issues, I, I will go to, to the solutions which they were suggesting over the time, is to create some small um, water retention in, in, the, in the area. This is one of these. One of was the water retention point. In 2006, it was being built. In 2009, this is what the situation is. But the point is, all around this area, it's built, so there is no infiltration. And this point of water is behind a big hospital. So it's a big problem, how to locate this area, because they, know they have no space. Another thing is to install um, basins where water can be pumped out, but people will dispose their waste, their solid waste in, this, in these places. So the engine are completely broken. So we, we are kind of in a loop of problems where floods reveal other problems, those problems impact the floods, and it goes like in a round circle. That is a big issue of management. These are the other solution. They create this basin to host the water, to get the water. And the rain was so heavy that this water was released back into the houses. And these are the type of machine engines they're putting there. No gas, just one person to say, oh, people, we're working on it, and we pump the water. The, the question is not how to pump the water. The question is how to structure the urban, the urban area. Um, while solving other problems, this is another issue I want to raise, because when we deal with adaptation, 
we, we go to climate change issues, but sometimes when the states are doing some infrastructure building, they're creating some other issues. Here is an example. This is a toll road, new toll road coming, going out of Dakar. In building this toll road, you would suggest that they make a bridge every time they find a water, water point. But instead of doing a bridge, they completely fill the line and let the road go. The, the consequence is that in areas where we did not have flat before, we do now have flats because of poor planning and poor management. So, now the last solution is, okay, these people are affected by floods. We take them from this place to this place. It's five miles away. Another big poor decision in terms of managing um, the area. Here is how the houses looks like. It's called Plan Jahai. It's really social houses, about uh, 12,000 US dollars. But this price for this house is very expensive for the, for the poor population still. So the question of poverty, development, and vulnerability comes in. This is how the house looks like. And the main question we are asking here is if people will not sell back these houses and pocket the money and go back in the flat prone areas. It, we call it population substitution. Because it happens in a World ba pro Bank program, which is called Parcel Asini. It was meant for poor people. They got the land, they built them nice houses, and the middle class come and buy the houses from them. It could happen in this type of situation. Oops, this is not the right presentation. Sorry, that's why. This is not the right presentation, but that's fine. <laughs> so. So who is accountable at the end of the day? Is the population who acquires the land in flood prone areas? The local administration who didn't prevent the floods? The technical services? Or the government with an unclear uh, policy uh, on urban issues? I tried to raise these questions uh, and suggest um, responses from you. Because until now, a lot of people was asking questions, but I want you to bring responses to the main issues we, we have raised here. I'm sorry this was not the last final presentation, but it gives a good picture of the situation of Dakar. Thank you very much. So, questions. so we can take some questions uh, in five minutes before lunch break. from China. So yeah. you give us a good case as for the, the flooding problem and as also as due to the process of urbanization. So my. We have also have this case in China. My question is you, you mentioned uh, quite a lot uh, the measures as for like uh, reallocate the population, bumping the waters, etc., etc. Do you have some like uh, uh, institutional arrangement from the city level or the national level to do this, like to cope with this problem? That's my question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The so institutional arrangement was uh, it was in my normal presentation, so that was to set up two things: a national agency for social houses and a, a, a government structure for rescuing in terms of uh, floods or other risk. So for the first house, social housing uh, structure, it's a lot of money and we're talking about corruption here. So is the right people have access to this money to get their social house? That was one big question. And on the rescue strategy, the point we had is that the local population was not involved. The point of view of local population has not been on board of this government structure to address these issues. And that was the main limitation. We have the ORSEC program. It's a regional organization of, uh, of rescuing. But this regional organization of rescuing is only government structure gathering and trying to find solution for local population who are not involved at the end of the day. 
and that is a big problem. And they create this agency and they're trying to gather money to, to, to respond to local population's needs. But there are a lot of stakes which are political. Um, is this community belongs to the party in the government or not? Is these people agree with me or not? So there's a lot of consideration which makes the distribution of these resources very uneven and that slow down the process. Just a follow up because this is a this is an, an important issue, um, and go back to the question of, of resilience. Um, one of the one of the big ironies and one of the big tragedies actually of, of this process is that even though the governments have uh, invest very scarce resources in in reconstruction of after damages, often the reconstruction is in the same place with the same standards, and the problem is repeated two or three years down the road. I mean, Mexico, for instance, just south of the border, uh, quadrupled its budget for attention of, of disaster relief this year, compared to last year, four times the budget. They're reconstructing the areas that were flooded a couple of months ago in different parts of the country. But they're reconstruction in the same place with the same standards, the same type of, of, of dealings and, and urban areas that were affected. So it's just a disaster on the waiting. I mean, next year in floodings, it's probably the same people who are going to be affected. So the challenge is, is how do we make a difference? How do we really transform into just a reactive response into a proactive and more resilient response to help these communities forward? And of course, this has become a business for some states, government, uh, as, uh, in, and local uh, governments has become a business, really, because they get a significant amount of resources all of a sudden after a disaster. And uh, it's not that it's only corruption, it's that the business of uh, the whole structure of, of our political and, and economic interests within that area is really profiting from the disaster of, of, of the poor people. Mm -hmm. question before lunch break. Are we having lunch break at 11.30? Okay. So we can have one last comment or question. I ask for solutions, so if somebody has some solutions to bring it along. <laughs> okay, no solution for the big